subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everybody. Welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we shall be analyzing the Hindu newspaper dated 12th of July 2020 of the New Delhi edition. The topics to be discussed today has been presented on your screen. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. Let us begin our today's discussion. Now this particular article appears in the form of a FAQ on page number 12. The title of the article here is Should Kuwait's Draft Expat Bill Worry India? The article that we are going to discuss here shall be important from the perspective of GS Paper 2 International Relations under the subsection Effect of Policies and Politics of Developed and Developing Countries on India's Interest as well as Indian Diaspora. Now before understanding various facets of this particular article, let us first look into its background. As you all must be aware, the Gulf Cooperation Council it is a regional grouping consisting of the six West Asian countries. These six countries are Saudi Arabia, Oman, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait. Now when oil was discovered in these six countries, these six countries attracted a large number of blue collared workers from various countries such as India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Philippines and so on. Now these blue collared workers as such were employed in a number of industries such as the oil industry, construction industries and so on. Later on during the 1990s, some of the West Asian economies believed that they should not excessively be dependent only upon the oil revenue and they have to diversify their economies towards the other sectors as well. For example, UAE has taken the path of the economic diversification in order to reduce its dependence on oil and focus on the development of financial sector such as banking, insurance, technology sector and so on. So since 1990s, highly skilled workforce from countries such as India have been migrating to the West Asian countries as well. The steady flow of migrants into the Gulf Cooperation Council countries has increased to such an extent that in some of the countries, the share of the international migrants is much higher than the share of their own citizens as well. Now, for example, in case of United Arab Emirates, the total population of UAE is around 9.6 million, which is roughly half of the population of the NCR in India. Now, the international migrants account for almost around 88 percentage of the UAE population and Indians alone account for almost around 30 percentage of UAE population. On the other hand, the share of the UAE citizens is hardly around 12 percentage. Similarly, in case of Qatar, the total share of international migrants stand at 78 percentage. In Kuwait, it is 73 percentage. In Oman, 46 percentage. Bahrain, 45 percentage. And in Saudi Arabia, it is 38 percentage. So, if you look at the demographic profile of Kuwait, the share of the international migrants in the overall Kuwaiti population is as high as 73 percentage. So the overall population of Kuwait is around 4.3 million out of which the Kuwaitis account for 1.3 million and the rest is accounted by the international migrants. In particular, Indians account for almost around 1.45 million. So as you can see here, the number of Indians in Kuwait is much higher than the Kuwaitis themselves. So in this regard, recently a committee of the Kuwait National Assembly has approved a new bill. As part of the new bill, the idea is to limit the number of international migrants in the overall population of Kuwait. So as per the bill, the idea is to ensure that the Indians do not exceed more than 15% of the overall Kuwaiti population. Such a bill not only targets the Indians, but it also targets the workers from other countries such as Egypt, Bangladesh, Philippines, etc. Now such a policy which has been proposed by Kuwait should not be seen by us as a standalone policy. Rather, such a policy is a part of a much broader policy of the nationalization of workforce that has been pursued by some of the West Asian economies. So as the name suggests, the nationalization of workforce means reduce the share of the international migrants in their overall population and create more amount of employment opportunities for the local youths. Hence, as part of this video analysis, let us understand the various dimensions related to the nationalization of workforce and we will also see whether 
such a policy would benefit the west asian economies or not and how is it going to have an adverse impact on the indian economy based upon our discussion a main question for the practice here could be the policies of the west asian economies aimed at nationalization of their workforce would have an adverse impact on both the indian economy as well as the west asian economies discuss now the various dimensions that we would be covering here include the present status of employment in west asia the policies of nationalization of workforce why it is being done by the west asian countries whether these programs will be successful and how it is going to have an adverse impact on the indian economy now as far as the background is concerned we can see a sense of complementarity between the indian economy and the countries of the gulf cooperation council the countries in the gulf cooperation council have a relatively lower population but they are extremely rich in crude oil and gas whereas on the other hand india has a world second highest population and it imports almost around 70 to 80 percentage of its crude oil requirements so we can say that in a way india has been providing the cheap labor force to the countries in the gulf cooperation council and it is in turn importing the crude oil and natural gas apart from that we must also realize that it is a cheap labor that india is providing to the gulf cooperation council which in turn is enabling the countries in the west asia to pursue the path of economic growth and development for example in the initial years india supplied the blue collared workers which enable these countries to focus on the various industries such as the oil refining industries construction industries and so on later on when countries such as uae pursued the path of economic diversifications towards the financial sector during that time india provided the highly skilled workforce to work in the banking sector it sector financial sector and so on so in a way india has been providing the human resources to the countries in the gulf cooperation council on the other hand the gulf cooperation council has been providing us with natural resources such as the oil and gas that is why we say that the nature of economic relationship between india and the countries in the west asia is a sense of complementarity the other aspect of the background we have already covered earlier so we have discussed that to the initial period these countries attracted a large number of blue collared workers later on as these countries pursued the path of economic diversification they started attracting the highly skilled workforce so the steady flow of migrants into these countries has increased to such an extent that the share of the international migrant workers is much higher than the share of the national population itself that is why the kuwait national assembly has proposed to introduce the expat quota bill in order to ensure that indians do not exceed 15% of the overall population now if you look at the present status of employment in the west asian countries most of the local nationals as such are employed in the public sector and not in the private sector this is so because the public sector has been able to attract a large number of local nationals on account of the higher wages the higher status in the society better working conditions and so on on the other hand if you look at the private sector jobs in the west asian countries these jobs are not considered to be highly paying as compared to the public sector the working conditions also happen to be quite poor that is why the local nationals have not been attracted towards the private sector so the private sector jobs in these countries is basically taken up by the international migrants so if you look at the overall policy of nationalization of workforce followed by the west asian economies the idea here is to increase the share of employment of the nationals in the private sector jobs and to reduce the dependence on the foreign workers now some of the policies of nationalization pursued by the west asian economies include the policy of nitaqat that has been followed by saudi arabia now nitaqat here basically stands for categorization now, as part of the nitaqat policy various private sector industries in saudi arabia are divided into various categories depending upon the share of the local nationals in their overall employment if the private sector entities are employing a higher share of local nationals then 
such private sector entities are rewarded by the government on the other hand if the private sector entities are employing less number of saudi nationals and if they are employing more number of foreign migrants then they are actually penalized by the government so this policy of nitaqat followed by saudi arabia is basically aimed at increasing the employment of nationals in the private sector jobs and to reduce the dependence on the foreign workers similarly other countries have been following such policies such as bahrainization in bahrain emiratization in uae omanization in oman and so on so the question which arises here is why are these countries focusing on the nationalization of their workforce now the reasons as such can be categorized into economic social as well as political now with respect to economic dimension there are broadly two reasons first and foremost the overall gdp growth rate in these countries has been reducing over a period of time this in turn has reduced the ability of the government to create more amount of public sector jobs for the local youths so as stated before the local youths have been basically been attracted towards the public sector jobs due to higher wages higher status and better working conditions and since the government has not been able to create such public sector jobs so now the government wants to create more amount of employment opportunities for the local youths in the private sector jobs through the nationalization of the workforce policies the second economic reason is to prevent the outflow of remittances so presently the international migrants working in these countries send back substantial amount of their income back to their families in the home countries now this outflow of remittances from the west asian countries is not helping them in any manner now just imagine if these countries focus on nationalization of workforce and create more amount of employment opportunities for the local youths then they would be able to prevent the outflow of remittances so whatever wages these countries would pay they would be paid to the local youths and these wages would be in turn be used for increasing the demand in their economies leading to the increase in the gdp growth rates so in a way by preventing the outflow of remittances the gulf cooperation council countries would be able to benefit by increasing the overall demand and boosting the gdp growth rates secondly from the social aspect since most of the private sector jobs are presently taken up by the international migrants and secondly since the government has not been able to create enough amount of public sector jobs there is a higher level of unemployment among the youths so this higher level of unemployment in turn makes the youths vulnerable to both radicalization as well as terrorism so by providing the employment opportunities for the local youths in the private sector jobs these countries would be able to prevent their radicalization as well as far as the political reason is concerned now we do all know that if a particular government fails to create enough amount of employment opportunities for the youths then this would lead to strong anti government sentiments and these strong anti government sentiments can manifest itself in the form of protest and unrest now we have seen in the recent past as to how the youth protest movement in the west asian countries in the form of arab spring had led to political instability so in a way the west asian countries would want to avoid a repeat of arab spring by focusing on the nationalization of the workforce but the question which arises here is whether the policies that are aimed at nationalization of workforce whether these policies will be successful or not first and foremost as stated before some of the countries in the west asia such as uae have been focusing on the economic diversification in order to reduce the dependence on oil and focus on the development of the financial and the technology sector now in order to do so these countries as such need highly skilled workforce but the problem here is that in these countries the education system as such has not developed to such an extent that it would be able to meet the requirements of the skilled workforce so in a way according to some of the experts the policies that are aimed at nationalization of workforce can be considered as a setback to the economic diversification program secondly as stated before the most of the local youths in these countries they are basically attracted towards the public sector and not the private sector 
this is primarily on the account of the fact that the private sector jobs are less paying they have low social status and the working conditions in the private sector jobs are quite poorer so even if these countries force the companies to hire the local youths the local youths as such may be reluctant to apply for the private sector jobs thirdly as stated before there is a sense of complementarity between the countries in the west asia and india wherein india has been providing the human resources to these countries which in turn has enabled these countries to focus upon their economic growth and develop it during the initial days india provided the cheap blue collared workers and later on as these countries focus upon their economic diversification india has provided the highly skilled workforce so it is because of the cheap labor force in these countries that the overall labor cost as such is quite lower and hence they have been able to attract a large number of foreign companies so going forward if these countries focus on nationalization of workforce they will not be able to attract the international migrants the labor cost in these countries will start going up and hence some of the companies which are presently working in these countries may be forced to move out so we can argue here that at least in the short and medium run the policies aimed at nationalization of workforce would not benefit the west asian economies as far as impact on india is concerned we can analyze this particular impact at both macro level as well as a micro level at the macro level now if you look at the overall remittances into india India gets an annual remittance of almost around 80 billion dollars which is considered to be the world's highest remittances and more than 50 percentage of these remittances basically come from the west asian countries so going forward if these countries focus on nationalization of workforce then there would be decrease in the inflow of remittances within the indian economy secondly the nationalization of workforce policies in the west asian countries would lead to increase unemployment for indians forcing them to migrate back to india and this would put additional burden on the government to create more amount of employment opportunities for the migrants who have returned back from the west asian countries lastly we must realize that the presence of indian migrants in the west asian countries has always been an important source of soft power diplomacy for india So going forward if the number of indian migrants in these countries reduce then india would lose its soft power in the west asian region at the micro level the policies aimed at nationalization of workforce in the west asian countries would lead to decrease in the household remittances within the indian economy leading to decrease in the overall income levels of the households So looking at all of these aspects it can be argued that the policies aimed at nationalization of workforce in west asia would have an adverse impact on both west asian economies as well as the indian economy moreover we must also realize that the west asian economies have got immensely benefited due to the inflow of the migrants from other countries and hence large scale replacement of the international migrants with the local youths seems to be a difficult task for the west asian economies now this is what you have to know with respect to this particular article now the next article appears on page number 13 the title of the article is the spectra of us sanctions the article that we are going to discuss here shall be important mainly with respect to gs paper 2 international relations under the subsection effect of policies and politics of the developed countries on india's interest Now, before analyzing this particular article, let us first look into the background. In order to improve India's defense preparedness, recently the Defense Acquisition Council has given an approval to procure around 21 MiG-29 and 12 Sukhoi-30 fighter jets from Russia. Now, this is a bilateral deal between India and its all-weather friend Russia. So, ideally, no third country should be able to jeopardize. such a defense deal however in reality the us officials have warned that waivers under the catsa law is not country specific so in a way the us officials have warned that india may not be able to get the waiver under the catsa law now catsa here stands for countering american adversaries through the sanctions act 
which has been passed by the US Parliament. Now this raises concerns for a number of reasons. Earlier, in October 2018, India wanted to buy the S-400 missile defense system from Russia. However, even that time also, US had warned India of sanctions under the CATSA law. Apart from that, when the Chinese military department bought the S-400 missile defense system from Russia, Chinese military department was put under sanctions under the CATSA law. Thirdly, Turkey is an important NATO partner of USA. Now, Turkey is involved in F-35 fighter jet program of USA. As part of the F-35 fighter jet program, Turkey is involved in manufacturing of some of the core components of the F-35 fighter jet. In spite of such close defense cooperation between Turkey and USA, recently Turkey decided to buy the S-400 missile defense system from Russia. So in response, as part of the sanctions, the US decided to expel Turkey from its F-35 fighter jet program. The Turkish pilots are no longer allowed to train on the F-35 fighter jets. So in a way, US has been using the CATSA law in order to prevent other countries from having any kind of defense deals with Russia. In this regard, let us understand the various facets related to the CATSA law. Now question that can be expected from this particular topic here could be discuss the implications of US CATSA law on India's defense preparedness. Also discuss as to why US needs to take a more pragmatic and nuanced approach and grant India a waiver under the CATSA law. Now coming to the first dimension of the article as to what exactly is countering American adversaries through the Sanctions Act. As the name suggests, the main objective of this particular act is to target the countries which US considers as the adversary countries. Some of the countries that are targeted under the CATSA law include Russia, Iran and North Korea. Under this particular act, the entities as such are prevented from having any kind of defense deals with Russia, Iran and North Korea. If any entity goes on to sign the defense deals with any of these three countries, then such an entity would be put under the sanctions. For example, as discussed earlier, both China as well as Turkey have been penalized through the economic sanctions for having the defense deal with Russia under the CATSA law. So under Section 231 of the CATSA Act, US can impose sanctions on the countries which have significant defense deal with the American adversaries such as Russia, Iran as well as North Korea. Now for example, if India goes on to have the defense deal with Russia and if India does not get a waiver under the CATSA, then first and foremost US can stop exporting critical defense goods to India. And secondly, it can ban the American companies from investing in India's defense sector. Now, under the CATSA law, the US president can grant a waiver to any country. Such a waiver can be provided under the National Defense Authorization Act. However, to get the waiver under the CATSA law, that is, in other words, in order to avoid the sanctions from USA under the CATSA law, for having the defense deals with say Russia, then a number of conditions would have to be fulfilled. So if these conditions are fulfilled, then the US president can grant a waiver to a particular country or an entity. The first condition here is that the country in question should give an undertaking that it would reduce its reliance on the Russian weapons. Secondly, the country should be ready to cooperate with US on important security related matters and thirdly the US president should believe that granting the waiver to a particular country is in the interest of US national security. So based upon the fulfillment of some of these conditions the US president may decide to grant a waiver to a particular country. So coming to the next dimensions as to what are India's concerns against the CATSA law. Now there is a global think tank known as the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. This particular global think tank publishes the data related to 
the global import and export of arms and ammunition now recently in march 2020 it had published a report and according to this particular report between the years 2015 to 2019 india accounted for almost around 9.2 percentage of the global import of the defense goods and accordingly india was placed at the second position and saudi arabia which accounted for 12 percentage of the global imports was placed at the first position so according to the stockholm international peace research institute india is the second largest importer of defense goods further this particular table here from the same report highlights as to from which countries india imports most of the defense goods as you can see here more than 50 percentage of the defense goods are imported from russia followed by israel and france now in case of india the ministry of defense has been trying to diversify the countries from which it imports the defense goods as part of such a diversification program the overall share of the russian goods in india's import basket has reduced from more than 70 percentage to around 50 percentage however in spite of such a diversification program more than 50 percentage of defense goods that india imports are basically imported from russia so if you look at the catsa law the catsa law basically prevents india from having major defense deals with russia thus in a way this goes against india's interest secondly the nature of defense cooperation between russia and india has changed from that of a buyer and seller to joint collaboration both india and russia are involved in a number of joint ventures such as brahmos multi role transport aircraft and so on so some of the experts have pointed out that catsa is likely to affect these joint ventures in future apart from that this is also likely to affect india's purchase of spare parts components of the russian defense goods which india had bought earlier so unless india purchases these spare parts and components the russian defense goods which are presently used by the indian defense forces would remain non functional so as you can see here the catsa law goes against india's defense preparedness and accordingly india has come up with counter arguments in support of a waiver under the catsa law first and foremost india has stated that the defense goods that it would procure from russia they would not be used against the interest of us secondly india has also argued that us sees india as a strategic partner for a number of reasons for example us sees india as a strategic partner in order to counter china it needs india's support in order to strengthen the maritime security in the indo pacific region so accordingly enhancing india's defense preparedness is not only in the best interest of india but it is equally the best interest of us as well thirdly india has also counter argued that india has embarked on a plan of diversification of its imports so going forward automatically because of such diversification program india's dependence on the russian goods would reduce and lastly india has also counter argued that the indian government is a sovereign entity and being a sovereign entity it has a complete liberty and freedom to choose from which country it would want to buy the defense goods us cannot pressurize india to buy the defense goods only from us and not to purchase it from russia now coming to last dimension as to why the catsa law is bad even for us that is why us has to take a more pragmatic and nuanced approach and grant india a waiver under the catsa law first and foremost as stated before india is considered to be quite important for usa looking at from the geo strategic perspective and as discussed before enhancing india's defense preparedness is not only in the best interest of india but it will also benefit usa so accordingly us needs to take a more pragmatic and nuanced approach and grant india a waiver under the catsa law secondly even from the economic perspective also the catsa law is bad for us 
This is so because as stated before, if an entity is put under the sanction, then US would stop the export of the critical defense goods and it would also ban the American companies from investing in defense sector. As stated before, India is the second largest importer of defense goods. So if US put sanctions on India, this would adversely affect the American companies who export the defense goods to India. Now this becomes quite important because the import of defense goods into India which was almost zero or nil in the year 2008. This has increased to almost around 15 billion dollars by the end of 2019. So in a way if US put the sanctions then it would affect the American companies who are exporting defense goods to India. Secondly, the government of India has consistently liberalized the FDA norms with respect to the defense sector. For example, recently the government of India as part of the Atma Nirbhar Bharat package enhanced the FDI limit in the defense sector from 49 to 74 percentage under the automatic route. And as far as the government route is concerned, already the government of India allows 100 percent FDI in the defense sector. Now this particular liberalization of the FDI norms in the defense sector has a capacity to attract more number of foreign companies. So if US bans the American companies from investing in the defense sector as part of the CATSA law, then this would end up adversely affecting American companies. Now these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article. The next article appears on page number 7 in the form of an interview. The title of the article is, We are still in a crisis and need a full reset of India-China relations. This article shall be important from the perspective of GS Paper 2, International Relations under the subsection India and its Neighborhood Relations. Now this particular article is in a form of an interview with Shu Shankar Menon. It is to be noted that Shu Shankar Menon is a former National Security Advisor who served under the Prime Ministership of Mr. Manmohan Singh. Shushankar Menon also served as a Foreign Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. Prior to that, he was the Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan, Sri Lanka and he was also the Ambassador to China. So since he has occupied the high profile positions under the Government of India, we need to take into account his views regarding the recent India-China border dispute. Now the contents of this interview would be important for both mains as well as interview. With respect to the mains examination, some of the points which are incorporated in this particular interview can be used by you while writing a mains answer with respect to India-China border dispute. Similarly with respect to interview, the viewpoints expressed in this particular interview will enable you to broaden your horizon with respect to the recent border tension between India and China. Now overall this particular interview focuses on four dimensions. First and foremost, as you must be aware, India-China border dispute has always remained a recurring theme. In the recent past, it was over the Doklam Plateau and now it has emerged over multiple points across the line of actual control including the Galwan Valley. But if you closely observe the Chinese behavior, it was Chinese PLA which initiated this border flashpoints and after initiating this border dispute China has agreed for disengagement. So it is quite difficult to understand as to why does China initiate the border dispute and then agree to disengage its troops. This has happened in both Doklam as well as the recent border dispute or multiple points across the line of actual control. Similarly, when we say that Indian and Chinese troops have agreed to disengage along the line of actual control, but what exactly do you mean by disengagement? How does a troop position along the line of actual control change post disengagement? Thirdly, what is China's overall grand strategy over the border dispute with India? And lastly, how should India counter China? Now all of these dimensions are actually closely related to each other. So let us understand the overall summary of this particular article. Now as stated before, China's strategy towards a border dispute is basically twofold. First and foremost, China chooses a point or multiple points along the line of actual control 
where it would want to escalate the border disputes. Usually the points which China chooses are the points where the border is well settled and hence it is not contested by either countries. For example, in recent times, China has initiated the border dispute over both Doklam as well as Galwan Valley. Now, if you look at both of these two areas, these two areas were well settled and they are not contested by China so far. So, initially China initiates a border dispute particularly over a region or a point which is well settled and not contested by it earlier. So, once the border dispute is initiated, China, it substantially increases its troop presence and after certain duration of time, it agrees for disengagement. So, the question which arises is, if China is finally agreeing to disengage its troops, then why did it initiate the border dispute in the first place itself? Now, in order to decipher this, we have to understand as to how the troop position along the line of actual control changes during the different stages of border dispute. That is the troop position before the border standoff, the troop position during the border standoff and the troop position after the border standoff. That is after the process of disengagement. Now let's say there is a particular region along the line of actual control and the LAC as such is mutually agreed by both the countries. Let's say at this particular place we have the Indian troops and at this particular place you have the Chinese troops. And both Indian troops as well as the Chinese troops are patrolling up to the line of actual control. This is basically done in order to ensure that either of these two countries do not cross the line of actual control. Now this is a troop position before the border standoff. Now what happens during the border standoff is China deliberately introduces a new flashpoint along the line of actual control. So it chooses a new location along the line of actual controls. It starts claiming that the new region belongs to China and in order to press forward its border claims, it substantially increases its troop presence in the region. So as you can see here, China is trying to unilaterally change the line of actual control. At the same time, the Chinese troops would also prevent the Indian army from carrying out the patrolling in the region. Now this has happened in both Galwan Valley as well as the Doklam Plateau. Now after the border tensions reach to a certain point, China then agrees for disengaging its troops. So what exactly do you mean by disengagement? Now according to Shu Shankar Menon, disengagement of troops basically has three facets. First and foremost, both India and China decide to pull back their troops from the disputed region. Secondly, they would agree to create a buffer zone and thirdly, both these countries would decide to su suspend the patrolling in the region. Now, according to Shushankar Menon, the terms of this disengagement is basically problematic for mainly two reasons. First and foremost, as you can see here, prior to the border standoff, Chinese troops were far away from the line of actual control. But now, after the process of disengagement, in a way, the Chinese army has moved much closer to the line of actual control. So what has actually happened here is that the Chinese troops has moved ahead by two steps. But after the border standoff, it has moved backward only by one step. So because of these two forward steps and one backward step, China as such has moved much closer to the line of actual control. So this is the first problem. The second problem here is if you look at this particular region as such, this region was never contested by China and it was in this particular region, Indian troops used to carry out patrolling in order to ensure that the Chinese army do not cross over the line of actual control. But what has happened after this disengagement is that India has decided not to carry out patrolling in this region. See, we have to agree to the fact that the process of disengagement between India and China has undoubtedly led to peace and tranquility along the line of actual control, at least in the short run. But at the same time, we have to ensure that China does not permanently establish its presence in the region. Now, according to Shu Shankar Menon, one of the best examples of China's grand strategy for the border dispute is the Doklam Plateau. Now, before 2017, the Chinese troops 
used to visit Doklam only once or twice in a year in order to signal their claim over the Doklam Plateau. But after the border standoff, China has established its permanent presence in the Doklam Plateau region. So looking at the previous experiences faced by India in its border dispute with China, the process of disengagement between India and China has undoubtedly led to short-term peace and tranquility along the border. However, at the same time, we have to ensure that such process of disengagement does not lead to permanent Chinese presence in the region. So overall, in order to summarize China's grand strategy over the border dispute with India, first and foremost, China starts a new face-off at a new location. After that, it builds up its troops presence in the region. Then after a certain duration of time, it starts withdrawing its troops and agree to a process of disengagement. Even though it vacates the flashpoint, but it establishes a very strong and permanent presence in the nearby areas. Now various other aspects related to the interview have been included in the PDF for your reference. I hope you will be able to go through the other aspects of the interview and understand on your own. With this, let us now take up the next article. Now the next article appears on page number 12 and is titled as Is the airborne spread of COVID-19 a risk? The article that we are going to discuss here shall be important mainly with respect to prelims under the subsection General Science. Recently, a group of 200 scientists from 32 countries across the world have urged the World Health Organization to recognize and address the aerosol transmission as one of the possible mode of COVID-19 transmission. The World Health Organization has acknowledged the risk posed by the aerosol transmission in the closed and the crowded environmental settings, particularly the healthcare settings. But at the same time, the World Health Organization has stated that there is no definitive evidence of the aerosol transmission. In this regard, let us understand the different modes of COVID-19 transmission and how the aerosol transmission is different from the present droplet transmission. Now, we all know that COVID-19 is a respiratory illness because of which the viral load is often present in the respiratory secretions of the infected person. Now, the respiratory secretions here could include saliva, phlegm, etc. Now, these respiratory secretions are transmitted when an infected person coughs, sneezes, talks or sings. So, if a normal person comes in contact with such respiratory secretions, then such a normal person could get infected. But at the same time, it is important to be noted that for a normal person to get infected, the viral load in the respiratory infection should be viable. That is the amount of virus in the sample droplet should be enough to undergo the replication in the host cells. So only when the viral load is viable, the normal person can get infected. So if the amount of virus in the droplet is lesser, then the probability of a normal person getting infected becomes lower. Now these respiratory secretions can infect a normal person either through the droplet transmission, fomite transmission or the aerosol transmission. With respect to the droplet transmission, in this case the respiratory secretions are of size of more than 5 microns and such kind of transmission occurs when the susceptible person comes in close contact with the infected person. So when we say the close contact, it is usually less than 1 meter. So when a normal person comes in close contact with the infected person, then there is a higher probability of these respiratory secretions of entering into his respiratory tract and infecting him. So such kind of transmission, we call it as a droplet transmission. The second one is the fomite transmission. Now under the fomite transmission, it may so happen that the respiratory secretions of an infected person, that is a viral load, may fall on some surface. So, if a normal person touches such a surface and then, and then after touching the surface, if he touches his nose, mouth or eyes, then such a normal person could get infected. So, such kind of transmission is referred to as the fomite transmission. Now, the third kind of transmission is a aerosol transmission. Now, aerosol transmission is a transmission that takes place through the respiratory droplets of less than 5 microns. So, in case of the droplet transmission, the size is more than 5 microns, whereas 
In case of aerosol transmission, the size of the droplets is less than 5 microns. So these respiratory aerosols of less than 5 microns are produced mainly through two different mechanisms. First and foremost, the respiratory droplets of an infected person that is saliva, phlegm, etc. can generate aerosols upon evaporation. So when the respiratory secretions evaporate, this can lead to generation of the aerosols of less than 5 microns. Secondly, they can also be produced during the normal breathing that is when an infected person exhales or breathes out. So unlike the droplet transmission, in case of the aerosol transmission, since the aerosol's size is less than 5 microns, they can remain suspended in air for a longer duration of time and thus they can infect a normal person. Apart from that, unlike in the case of droplet transmission, where a normal person has to come in the close contact with the infected person, in case of aerosol transmission, the normal person can get infected even when he does not come in close contact with the infected person. Now presently there is a growing debate over the aerosol transmission of COVID-19. According to some of the experts, there is a higher probability of the aerosol transmission in the close spaces, whereas when it comes to open places, the possibility of the aerosol transmission is quite lower. This is so because in case of open spaces, the aerosols as such are much smaller and hence they would get dispersed. That is the aerosols would get spread out in the air and as the aerosols spread out in the air, in the open spaces, the overall viral load reduces. So as discussed before, if a normal person has to get infected, the viral load as such should be sufficient enough to undergo the replication in the host cells. So according to some of the experts, the viral load of the aerosol transmission in the open spaces is quite lower and hence there is a lower probability of the aerosol transmission in the open spaces. But at the same time, there is a higher probability of the aerosol transmission in the closed spaces since the aerosols as such remain suspended in air for a longer period of time and they do not spread out. And lastly, as of now, the World Health Organization has stated that there is no definitive evidence of the aerosol transmission of COVID-19. But if indeed aerosol transmission is taking place, then Wearing of N95 mask would have to be made mandatory. This is so because the aerosols have a size of less than 5 microns. That is why people would have to compulsorily wear the N95 mask. Apart from that, people would have to start avoiding crowds as well as closed areas. In addition to respiratory secretions, the COVID-19 virus has also been detected in other biological samples such as urine, plasma, breast milk, etc. As a result, the other possible modes of transmission include breastfeeding, transmission from mother to baby through the placenta, blood transfusion, etc. However, these modes have not been recognized as a potential mode of transmission as there are no evidences to prove that the viral load from these routes are viable enough to infect a person. Now, these are some of the important aspects which one should know with respect to this particular article. Now in today's newspaper, there are a number of articles that are quite important for your prelims examination. Let us have a quick look at some of these important articles. The first article appears on page number 8 and is titled as Soras's drug gets the DGCI not for the emergency use. As the title of this particular article suggests, the Drugs Controller General of India has recently cleared Itolizumab a drug which is used to treat the skin disorder psoriasis for the treatment of COVID-19. So with respect to your prelims, let us understand some of the drugs which have been approved for the treatment of COVID-19. First and foremost, you have Remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug. Now this particular drug inhibits the replication of virus and it is used for treatment of moderate to severe illness. However, at the same time, experts have pointed out that the remdesivir drug could have an adverse impact on liver and kidney. Next drug you have is Favipiravir, which is once again an antiviral drug and just like remdesivir, it inhibits the replication of virus. It is also considered to be the first oral drug as well. It has already been approved in India and it is in clinical stage in Japan, Europe as well as USA. It is used to treat the patients who are 
moderately symptomatic to severely ill. Next, you have the hydroxychloroquine, which is used to treat malaria. Now, its efficacy as such has been questioned by the World Health Organization. Accordingly, it has halted the HCQ clinical trial under the solidarity trial. Next, you have dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory steroid drug. And this drug is basically used in order to reduce the mortality rate of the COVID-19 patients. Then you have a combination of drugs that is doxycycline and ivermectin. Now the combination of these drugs is used for treating the acute symptoms in the COVID-19 patients. Next you have ritonavir and iopinavir. Both of these drugs are antivirals and used to treat the HIV patients. However, the World Health Organization has decided to put on hold these drugs as part of the solidarity trial. And lastly, as discussed recently, the Drug Controller General of India has approved the itolizumab, which is commonly used to treat the skin disorders such as psoriasis. Next, we have an article on page number 6. The title of the article is Red Sanders Worth 1 Crore Seized in Sechachalam. Now this particular article related to Red Sanders becomes quite important because a rated question on Red Sanders has already been asked in prelims 2016. So let us understand some brief details about the Red Sanders. Now Red Sanders is considered to be a non-aromatic variety of sandalwood. It is endemic to southern India. It is mainly found in category of forest known as southern tropical dry deciduous forest. Among these forests it is mainly found in the Palkonda and Sechachalam hills of Andhra Pradesh. Now the location of Palkonda and Sechachalam hills in the state of Andhra Pradesh have been highlighted as shown in this particular map. Apart from the state of Andhra Pradesh, they are also found in certain isolated regions of the neighboring states of Tamil Nadu as well as Karnataka. Now presently there is huge demand for the red sanders in the international market because it is used for making musical instruments, furniture. Further, it is also used as an immunity medicine in China. Because of these reasons, there is a huge amount of illegal felling of the red sanders, typically in the states of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu as well as Karnataka. As per the IUCN, it is categorized as near threatened category and under the CITES convention, it has been placed under the Appendix 2. As you all must be aware, under the CITES convention, if a particular plant or animal species is placed under Appendix 1, then this would mean that there is complete prohibition on the international trade of those animal or the plant species. On the other hand, if a particular species is placed under Appendix 2, this would mean that the international trade in those plant or animal species is tightly controlled. So since the red sanders has been placed under Appendix 2, this essentially means that the international trade in the red sanders is tightly controlled. Red Sanders was also in news because earlier the Indian government had put a complete ban on export of Red Sanders. However, in the year 2019, the Indian government allowed the export of Red Sanders provided the Red Sanders is obtained from the cultivated land. So the Red Sanders from the forest cannot be exported, but if the Red Sanders is obtained from the cultivated land, only then it can be exported. Now coming to the question that was asked in prelims 2016, the question here was with reference to red sanders sometimes seen in the news, consider the following statements. The first statement was, it is a tree species found in part of South India which as we have discussed is correct. The second statement reads, it is one of the most important trees in the tropical rainforest areas of South India. As we have discussed, it is mainly found in the tropical dry deciduous forest and hence statement number two here is wrong. Accordingly, the right answer here would be A, that is one only. Now, the next article appears on page number 13 and is titled as The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Now, this particular article highlights about the rise and growth of the National Security Advisor, Mr. Ajit Doval. Now, with respect to UPSC examination, let us understand in brief about India's security architecture, in particular about the National Security Council and the National Security Advisor. So the National Security Council is a three-tier organizational structure that oversees India's political, economic, energy and security issues of strategic concern. The National Security Council is headed by Prime Minister and it comprises of the Home Minister, 
defense minister external affairs minister as well as the finance minister the main mandate of the national security council is to advise the prime minister's office on all the matters related to the national security and the strategic interest now this three tier institutional structure of the national security council comprises of the strategic policy group the national security advisory board and the national security council secretariat with respect to strategic policy group this particular group was earlier chaired by the cabinet secretary but it underwent restructuring in the year 2018 and after its restructuring in the year 2018 it is now headed by the national security advisor the main mandate of the strategic policy group is to assist the national security council on important matters related to the national security apart from that the strategic policy group is also the principal mechanism for achieving interministerial coordination in the matters related to the national security it is to be noted that once the decisions are taken by the strategic policy group the cabinet secretary coordinates and implements the decisions of the strategic policy group next we have the national security advisory board as the name suggests this is a board which has been set up in order to advise both the national security council as well as the national security council secretariat as a advisory body it undertakes a long term analysis and provides perspective on issues related to the national security then we have the national security council secretariat which is headed by the national security advisor as the name suggests the national security council secretariat acts as a secretariat for the national security council and the national security advisor is considered to be a principal advisor to the prime minister on all the matters related to the national security now with respect to your prelims you should basically understand two things first is what is the mandate of these institutional structures and secondly who heads each of these institutions now these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article Now the next article appears on page number twelve and is titled as Indian Air Force on a Buying Spree. Now this particular article highlights that the Defence Acquisition Council has recently given an approval of defence procurement worth thirty nine thousand crores. Now this defence procurement would include the procurement of around twenty one MiG twenty nine fighter jets and around twelve Sukhoi thirty fighter jets from Russia. now with respect to your prelims let us have a brief understanding about the defense acquisition council in india now the defense acquisition council is headed by the defense minister and as the name suggests this particular council is vested with the responsibility of giving the in principle approval of the capital acquisitions which are required to be taken place as part of the various defense deals signed by india so once the defense acquisition council takes a decision these decisions are implemented by multiple institutions and agencies we have the defense procurement board which is headed by the defense secretary then we have the defense uh, the defense production board is headed by secretary defense production then we have defense research and development board which is headed by secretary defense research and development further in order to assist the defense procurement board we have the separate defense acquisition wing which is headed by the director general now the next article appears on page number 13 and is titled as the museum of conflicts now this particular article basically becomes important with respect to the important places in news for the prelims examination this article has appeared in the newspaper because recently turkey's highest court has decided to turn the istanbul's hagia sophia museum into a mosque now if you look at hagia sophia it is listed as unesco world heritage site and it is located in istanbul turkey originally it was a orthodox christian cathedral later on in the 15th century it was turned into a mosque but in the 20th century precisely during the 1930s it was converted to make turkey more secular but now turkey's highest court has decided to turn this museum back into mosque now with respect to your prelims examination you are required to know as to what exactly is hagia sophia and where is it located now coming to the question for the day the question here is who among the following 
are the members of the national security council the options which are given here are prime minister home minister defense minister and finance minister now coming to the question that was asked in yesterday's dns the question here was with reference to proposed fiscal council consider the following statements the first statement was the fiscal council is a proposed independent body that would monitor the government's fiscal performance including adherence to fiscal rules this statement here is correct second statement is it shall be entrusted with the responsibility of formulating the general budget this statement here is wrong this is so because it will only assist the government in the formulation of the budget the third statement is the frbm review committee has recommended setting up of the fiscal council in india as discussed in yesterday's dns the third statement here is correct accordingly the right answer here would be c that is 1 and 3 only